for it that covers both macro and micro, but it does depend on how you purchase it. So um, if you have any questions about that when you're, when you're purchasing it, uh, let me know, but you can pick kind of um, different ways to buy it and there's slightly different pricing. But if you were taking them, most of you who are in here bought the, whatever, maybe four month package or something to where it'll cover both micro and macro. And so you should be able to click the link and you're gonna go right into the macro stuff. So, um, any questions there? All right, so, I guess I should introduce myself a little bit. Let me let me see the. I'll, I'll go ahead and do attendance maybe, and do a little bit of uh, where you're from. Since we do, I see a few new faces in here. You can take micro or macro in either order. So, let's see if I got a pen buried in here somewhere. There. <coughs> All right, so I will say your last name, and if you can tell me your first name or nickname or however you want to be addressed, and and then maybe uh, just where you're from. Uh, Benton. Bronner. Um, Madison, and I'm from Seattle. Seattle. Carney. No Carney today. Castling. Uh, Cage from Arkansas. Okay. Churchwell, Cohen, Cooper, Corger, Long time from France. Okay. Uh, Crum. All right. And Curtis. <coughs> Uh, Zinge. Bob, all right. Epperson. Blake from And you said Blake? Blake. Blake, that's right. Never. <laughs> that's none of the names on here, so I gotta write that out here. All right, all right gotcha. Ash. Simon. Simon from Kansas. Figaro. Figueroa. And she's not here anyway. Okay, good. She doesn't have to hear me butcher her name. Galbraith. From where? Kansas. Kansas, okay. Hamar. Hamar, is there? Harrison. Hendricks. Joseph. Karubi. France. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Cole. Uh, Alex. Man. Mary from Tennessee. Martin. Josh from Kansas. <laughs> Melton. Uh, Milovic. Uh, uh, Morrissey, Navrate, Nicholson, Hello. I'm Jesse, I'm from Wyoming, Okemba, Olivio, Xavier from Dallas, okay, from where? Dallas, Dallas. okay, uh, Pichet, uh, Pidello, Prather, Rarden, Rees, Rees, Rios, and Rocchio. Vinny from Texas. Vinny from Texas. Uh, Robito, Sergeant Schutzbach. Spencer. Carson from Oklahoma. Swanson. Uh, Tikwe, Tokia. From Washington. 
on Holton. Chase, and Wheel. Wild? Yes. All right. Okay, so my name is Russ McCullough. Uh, for those of you who are new, I've been here in Kansas for 12 years now, maybe pushing 13. I came in 2011. And uh, so I was in real estate development back in Iowa. So uh, the macro economy, trying to tell a little story, impacted me quite a bit um, as the economy went into the what's called the financial crisis or the Great Recession. And uh, things got kind of bleak. I had, uh, oh, um, we managed about over 800 apartment units and uh, had uh, ownership slices in a number of them. And so when tenants don't pay the rent, it gets hard for us to make our payments. And so we had to kind of work through a lot of stuff with uh, the changes that went on in the macro economy uh, that affected us locally um, and what we did with, with real estate. So um, ultimately, uh, real estate development wasn't nearly as fun as it used to be. And so I started beating the bushes and uh, went full-time teaching. So I did my PhD in economics at Iowa State and then uh, headed down here in 2011. And so I've been here ever since. Um, so I hold the Wayne Angel Chair of Economics. And so Wayne Angel was a graduate from OU. He went to KU for his PhD in economics and then came back here and was a professor for about 20, 25 years. Uh, and then in 1985, he got appointed by then President Ronald Reagan to serve on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. So this is a group of seven people that basically control the supply of money in the United States. It's kind of a big deal. And so he was a the, uh, one of the leaders of the central bank, basically, not the leader. The leader is the chair. We'll get in, we've got a whole chapter on money and banking that'll be a lot of fun. Uh, but little old Wayne Angel, and he is actually little, he's only about five foot one or so, uh, from liberal Kansas, uh, ended up being pretty influential um, around the world, really, in, in, in what he did. And so over the years, he's been on the news giving his opinion about the economy uh, and that sort of thing. A student of his, Jim Wartney, um, graduated in 1962, and uh, he went on to create the Economic Freedom Index of the world. And so this is a single number that kind of shows how easy it is to do business in different countries around the world and how that can lead to better outcomes, like better access to drinking water, longer life expectancy, lower infant mortality rates, and less poverty. And so he's been influential around the world. Uh, and he grew up in Leavenworth, Kansas and uh, was a student of Wayne's here at Ottawa University <clears throat> and went on to do those things. He also served as the uh, uh, chair of the Council of Economic Advisors uh, back then to Ronald Reagan. So he served in a position uh, of pretty high esteem in the economics profession uh, during the 80s then. So we have kind of a rich history here at Ottawa uh, with macroeconomics and we'll weave some of that stuff in as we go through. And so macroeconomics, as opposed to microeconomics, um, tries to make sense of data at a more aggregated level. So we're going to use the word aggregate a lot in here. So we're, uh, aggregate simply means summing up. And so what we're summing up is individual activity. So microeconomics deals with you making decisions. Should I order beer and chicken wings or should I order a burger and fries? Like literally, right? Uh, those of you who had micro, we kind of deal with those micro decisions of individuals and businesses. And so at the macro level now, we'll look at more of how those decisions impact big macro variables like inflation, unemployment, and the income of the nation. So your income that you make at your part-time job while you're at college ultimately contributes to the income of the nation. So, you know, does it make sense for us to measure the income of the nation? And we'll kind of explore questions like that in macroeconomics. It also allows us to make comparisons across countries. Why are some countries rich and some countries poor has been a, a, a thing that's been continually explored in economics for years and years, even dating back all the way to 1776 with uh, Adam Smith writing a book called an inquiry 
into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. So even back in 1776, he observed, why, well, this is weird, we're all human beings, why are some countries uh, better off than other countries? And so uh, he was really, he's known as the father of economics because he's the one that uh, started to formalize some of these uh, thoughts on how the world works and decisions are interrelated with each other. All right, so that's a quick little intro into macro and how it relates to Ottawa. So here is our week by week progression. Um, so those of you who are in micro, this is a repeat chapter. There's a couple of repeat chapters. So chapter three is a repeat chapter, which we're gonna start off today with. And then chapter 18 is a new chapter. So everybody's new with that. That's gonna be international trade. And it might seem kind of weird that we're jumping into international concepts before we talk about national concepts with the United States, for instance. Uh, but it turns out the foundations of international trade are really based in microeconomic principles. And so that's why we start off with uh, the international stuff here for week one. And then week two, uh, we get into again another uh, repeat chapter is chapter six for those of you in micro. So you still have some homework assignments and other stuff. But uh, the economics of political action. So especially with this course in macro, we start to see how um, uh, the political economy or the political process uh, ends up being an important factor in determining what stuff we get from tax revenues. But we also learned that it can also lead to bad outcomes when the political process doesn't quite operate the same as the market process. And so things like favoritism and lobbying and expensive golf trips and steak and lobster uh, can possibly sway uh, the political process in different directions. And how that, uh, even just a basic old uh, democracy of uh, doing some sort of majority rule doesn't get the outcomes that we always uh, hope it would be. You know, so, oh, we'll, we'll just all vote on it and everything will be okay. It turns out it's not okay. In fact, we'd expect it to not be okay. We're not gonna get the socially efficient outcome by relying on a majority rule. It's just that we have to rely on a majority rule for other reasons, and in some cases we can improve upon majority rule by setting up maybe some different types of uh, rules and how collective action gets done, but often it's difficult to overcome the political process that's already entrenched. So it gets kind of ugly quick, right? Is politics relatively ugly, as near as you can tell? Yes. Is it kind of ugly? Yeah. So politics is ugly and that's why. we got all these interests of people kind of grabbing uh, for things and, and really, you know, what's best for the nation really is kind of secondary. It's more of uh, other things going on, unfortunately. Um, and there's not a lot of good answers for it as well. So that's what we explore there. And then this is really what I would call the beginning of macro. So chapter seven is uh, kind of the start of macro. Well, we'll learn about some of those important uh, variables. We'll continue that into week three. And then we'll build the big model of the economy to try to make predictions. So economists make six figures because we're in the prediction business. So we want to know, well, what if the government takes this policy, is that going to cause inflation? Is it going to reduce unemployment? Is it going to reduce unemployment, but it's also going to in increase inflation, right? What are the trade-offs? So that's what we use our economic toolbox uh, to help make predictions. And so. Uh, the, the latter half of the course here, we start applying uh, models to be able to make predictions about what we think might happen when we have a COVID crisis and we give everybody a $1,500 check to try to, to help people out. Uh, do we end up helping people out? Do we hurt the poor more than we help the poor when we have a $1,500 check that leads to 10% inflation at the cash register for the next four years? Did we really help the poor out? Or ultimately, did we end up hurting the poor? The rich are gonna stay rich, usually, is what the studies find. So they're gonna be able to move money around. $1,500 uh, to a person making $150,000, right? What's the big deal? But the person making $30,000 a year, $1,500 is all of a sudden something material, but so is 10% inflation over the next uh, four years. 
four times 30,000, if we look at their income, is 120,000. 10% inflation is 12,000 bucks. So we just affected that person's income by a negative 12,000 perhaps through inflation, but we gave them a $1,500 check, right? We kind of un unintendedly uh, perhaps hurt the poor more than we did uh, the rich with that. So we'll kind of take a look at different ways we can measure that and try to tease that out of, of the data on some of these macroeconomic concepts. Okay, so then on the flip side, any questions on the content? All right, so on the flip side, you have your point breakdown. We got 810 points for the course. And uh, a lot of these points are in what we call mind tap. So um, about 80% of the points there are in this mind tap. And uh, that'll be online homeworks and quizzes and some other activities uh, to help you get it. A lot of those points are what I call gimme points. They're pretty easy to get, uh, but you gotta do them on time. Uh, so a lot of times people fall down by not staying on top of the material. So would you guys agree with that, those of you who are in micro? Is it good to hit it early and stay on top of it? Yeah, it'll, it'll pay dividends. So don't wait, even though the due dates are like Saturday and Sunday, don't be a weekend warrior. Start earlier and start to get some of that stuff on. With this being an eight week course, it is boom, boom, boom. And there's a decent amount of content that we're hitting. So start early and you can start working on some of that uh, content to really uh, try to master it from week to week so that you're not uh, trying to cram a bunch of stuff in at the end. And make sure you get those points and you're on time, otherwise it's a 20% late penalty if you turn it in late. Uh, which isn't gonna kill you if it happens a couple times. We got a lot of points in the course, so if something is worth even 50 points, you know, 20% is, uh, what are we talking, 10 points, right? So it's not out of 810 points for the semester. If, you, if you're late once or twice, but don't make it a habit of being late, right? Try to be habitual about being on time. Uh, the rhythm of the course is pretty easy. It's always this Saturday, Sunday, so you're not gonna have a lot of gotcha deadlines or something. You need to be planning ahead if you've got activities coming up on the weekend uh, so that you can get there. Okay, so we do have in-class uh, midterm and tests. So those are coming from our lecture notes. So everything that I write on the board, I suggest you write in your notes. And this is going to be kind of your navigation towards the midterm and final. So there, these are in class and they're handwritten. The MindTap stuff is all gonna be online and some multiple choice and uh, you know I can't help it if in some cases, you, some of it I don't care if you work with a friend or something on your homework. Uh, but you can maybe not learn a ton and get through some of that MindTap stuff. And I know that. So that means your midterm and your test final exam are gonna be hard. And you need to polish up on them and actually master the material before you get to it. Um, so that you can uh, do well for the whole course if you're shooting for an A, for instance, or a B. All right, so any questions there? All right, um, well, before I uh, forget, there are, there's also discussion questions that you'll see in Blackboard. Those are not for this course. So this same course is the same content that the online students get, but they have to do those discussion posts. And you guys coming to class uh, with attendance uh, here is, is uh, meeting that objective. And so <clears throat> a lot, for quite a few courses too, or uh, classes, uh, if there doesn't seem to be a lot of people in the room and it's a little sparse, or uh, maybe it's the start of class and there's not a lot of people here, uh, you'll get extra credit. So those add up over time too. So at the end of the class, when I'm doing final grades and you're kind of on uh, the bubble, that will often be a bubble breaker is what I call it, right? So even if you're at uh, you know, 78.9% or something, but you've been here every class, you've got all the extra credit, um, that can move you up enough to get a, a B still. That can push you up into that level. So uh, you come to class, do your thing, um, and uh, do your best on the content, and, and that should work to your favor. All right, so then we have a project, the Economic Freedom Project. 
So this is going to be our, one of our last weeks that we do the economic freedom content. And so you're going to pick a country. I mentioned this already. There's five areas of economic freedom. We'll talk more about this as we get closer to it. Uh, but you're going to have a short little write-up on it. This is not a, uh, a group project like we had for micro. Um, and you're going to do either one of two things, a 60-second video presentation of your subtopic. So that's like a quick elevator pitch. Or you can use some sidewalk chalk about your country that you chose and uh, economic freedom. And you can write something on the pathway. I love it for graduation, especially when... I have the sidewalk with some sidewalk chalk and economic freedom stuff from the class project so that moms and dads uh, going to graduation see all the good work that you guys have done. So that's kind of fun for, for me. So I like the sidewalk chalk option for that as well. Okay, use of personal digital devices. So turn off your vibrate and your ringer. So if you got your phone out, if you want to go ahead and turn it all the way off, and then put it all the way down in your pocket. So not sitting on the seat, uh, in your backpack, so it's not out, not being disturbed. So that is, uh, according to some research, I'm not trying to just be mean, I'm just, uh, I'm an economist. If it turned out that you guys performed better in class with it on the, on the desk and ignoring me, I, I would be up for it, man, that'd be great. Like, show me the evidence, I'm, a, I'm an economist, right? So. Uh, but it turns out that um, they did some experiments. And so this is how we do economic experiments. I don't know if we'll do any of this term or not, but they had uh, thousands of students like you guys have three things. One, keep your phone in the dorm. Don't even bring it to class. Number two was phone in the backpack. Number three was phone on the desk, like we do a lot. And then they gave these assessments and the students who performed the best or the ones with the phones in the dorm room. Now, I'm not gonna frisk you when you come in here, so I'm not gonna say that, but you might wanna challenge yourself to actually try leaving it in the dorm room. See if you, you know, if you, you know, work better, stay more focused in class, you know, you can always check your phone after 50 minutes or whatever and go back to your dorm room, but that's up for you. But the second best was the backpacks. So the, the worst performers was having it on the desk where you get that disruption, and a lot of studies show even a, you know, a three-second disruption, it can cause a minute or a minute and a half or something for you to even re-engage with whatever you were listening to. So a lot of good research on uh, phone distractions. So, so do not engage with your device outside of class. Same thing with you on laptops. So um, I will be looking for eyeballs, and if uh, the Frenchman over here has uh, some neat stuff that he's pulled up for watching game tape or other things and you know it's kind of fun stuff so his eyeballs are looking at your screen then you're gonna lose your computer privileges right so so keep your computers on actual class content here of taking notes um, and uh, close off your email notifications or whatever you need to do uh, to stay engaged all right, um, now, internal distractions like daydreaming and good old-fashioned disruptions of excessive talk with a neighbor will not cost you points, but will be uh, subject to a verbal lashing or different seating assignment at my discretion. Uh, attendance and participation. Come to class every day you eat. Everybody understand what that means? I don't see a lot of starving people out there. So come to class every day you eat. I want you here. 100% attendance is expected. I mean, you should just be here every day. And I know that seems weird because we're like, oh, don't you understand? We have this thing called COVID. And we're like, we didn't even have to go to class. Yeah, I know. But it's not the best thing to do. One of the easiest things you can do, I think, is just go to class. Um, I'll try to keep it uh, entertaining and educational, some edutainment as, as it's known. Uh, but yes, plan on coming to class, and that's going to help you out your grades. Um, you should make uh, appointments during class uh, so that you do, uh, don't have to. Uh, you should make appointments during class. You should not make appointments during class time. I knew what I wanted to say, but I wasn't saying it. Uh, you know, like doctor's appointments and dentists. I always kind of hate it when students come up and say, oh, I have a dentist appointment. I'm like, really? Are you sure you couldn't have made it 3 o'clock in the afternoon instead of right during class time? And like, a lot of times students don't think about that. And I was like, eh, I think you should. 
Uh, every now and then you may pick up a few extra credit points, dragging yourself to class, making it through a lecture of mine. You may also earn some of these points correctly by stirring up some of the tougher questions I have in class. Points can go the other way too. I almost inevitably get busted with an incoming ring <clears throat> each class. Uh, so if that happens, everybody who's present gets a point. And uh, so it happens to me too, if you forget to shut it off. So if your thing goes off, you're gonna lose a point, but if mine goes off, everybody here gets a point. All right, so any questions on that? All right, and then academic integrity, don't cheat. The consequences can range from an F on the item to after the course reporting to the dean. Um, APA writing format uh, is what our general adopted thing is here for the B school. We have that short little paper, so that doesn't really apply to that one very much. Um, and then if you have any special needs or accommodations, uh, please uh, get with me at the beginning of the semester as soon as you can. I'll try to get those figured out for you. Okay. Any question? This is what I call, by the way, the syllabus cover sheet here, detail sheet. Uh, online, there's, mo there's more stuff on your Blackboard shell that has um, uh, additional items. So, But this is kind of that short and sweet summary sheet that's a little easier to go through. All right, any questions? Okay, well, let's start with chapter three. All right, so again, this is the chapter that is some review for those of you at micro, but I haven't quite got to all the final exams yet, but I suspect, as usual, after teaching this for 25, 30 years, that some of you who already had micro could use some review of the basic chapter three again. So this should uh, hopefully be useful for new people as well as others. All right, so uh, what we're trying to tackle here is demand and supply. So the demand and supply framework. And let me just start by kind of putting where we're going. So if we're talking about the demand for beer, we have a supply and demand. Let me write them all out here. Supply and demand. And so in the output market, the supply is coming from businesses in a free enterprise system. And the supply is re related to the cost of doing business. So we'll often put in here that the supply is equal to MC. And MC stands for marginal cost. Marginal cost is an important economic concept that evaluates the cost of an additional unit. So marginal cost is the cost associated with an additional unit of production. More generally, you can also think of it as the cost of an action or a decision. Maybe like, let's put decision too, but you're actually taking action, but you might be deciding it ahead of time. How many of you brushed your teeth this morning? Show of hands. Okay, looks like most of you. And so that action, we can look at what is the marginal cost of brushing your teeth, right? So you used a, a little bit of toothpaste, but after you've opened the toothpaste, uh, you know, can you really go return it to Walmart? No, so there's really not much cost there. It's kind of a uh, what we call a sunk cost. It's not really recoverable. You can't resell your toothpaste very well. So that's probably free, um, the cost of the toothpaste. And the toothbrush as well, after you've brushed your teeth. So we're basically down to almost no monetary explicit cost of brushing your teeth. So then it's just a time factor, right? So 
Uh, I'm gonna have to spend, I usually like to spend the uh, doctor recommended, what do they recommend even? Cause I don't do it, but I'm like 45 seconds at best. But what are you supposed to do, a minute? Minute each side. Of minute each side, oh gosh, it's like an eternity. I got things to do. I'm a busy person, right? So you gotta evaluate uh, the opportunity cost of your time and maybe the probability of uh, cavities with your family or something if there's some genetics going on there, whatever. So um, each time you do something, it's the cost of that. It's not the cut, the, the main highlight here I wanna make is that it's not the cost associated with never brushing your teeth or the cost associated with uh, only brushing your teeth half of the days of a year and you go a full year. That's not really what we're talking about with marginal cost. It's the cost associated with a small change, right? A one unit change, like today. Should I brush my teeth today or should I not? And so the uh, chance of giving, getting a cavity because you didn't brush your teeth this morning is probably next to nothing, right? So on any given day, you could possibly uh, pass on brushing your teeth, but as you know, if you, if you get into a habit of passing on brushing your teeth, then all of a sudden the cavity monster comes, right? So that's what we're thinking about here with marginal costs for a business, is the cost associated with making another case of beer, if this is cases of beer off the track. And so what we see is that as more and more cases of beer are made, the cost of beer is going up. So the supply, uh, businesses have to get a higher price if they offer more beer for sale to justify it because the cost is going up. So we have this upward sloping supply curve. The demand curve shows the marginal benefit. So the marginal benefit The MB is the change in benefit from another unit of consumption So we have a downward sloping demand curve for a couple different reasons. One is people are different, is probably the main thing. So we might say, you know, why is marginal benefit downward sloping? So I think number one is people are different and value products differently. Alcoholics alcoholics <coughs> place a high value on beer. So if we start to think about this demand for beer, the Elkies are down here. These are kind of the high value customers. This person out here that bought this beer, the 10th beer, they were willing to pay, uh, I don't know, let's say $32 for that case of beer. They want the beer bad, maybe to get the shakes to go away or something. Whatever their reason is, they're willing to pay more. They're willing to pay more for beer. And then some other people here are kind of mediocre to beer. Maybe they had alcoholic moms and dads or something and they're really against it or whatever, but they'll casually drink beer, but they're not gonna pay very much for it. And so these people over here are low value customers. 
They're not anti-beer, they're still gonna enjoy a beer every once in a while, but this person is only willing to pay, you know, $5 for the case of beer. So if it was cheap enough, they would buy it. Otherwise they prefer Coca-Cola or maybe something else, right? But if it was there, they would buy it. So we all, we have people across the spectrum valuing beer differently. And so when we look at the demand for beer in Ottawa or the demand for beer in the United States, imagine we've got all of these people here thinking about their valuation. All right, so questions or comments on that? There's another number two here that I want to add in. And I'm just going to give it to you here. The law of diminishing marginal benefit. I'll put parentheses utility, but I don't think we actually use the word utility. But those of you who have had microeconomics, we had utility. But it's a pretty easy concept. I think everybody knows it. Um, you know, as you start to open up the uh, package of Oreo cookies and you really wanted a cookie, you eat the first cookie, you eat the second cookie, you eat the third cookie, you eat the fourth cookie. How do you compare the enjoyment that you get from the seventh cookie as opposed to the first cookie? Which one did you enjoy more? Which one brought you more happiness? The seventh Oreo or the first Oreo? The first, right? So as we consume more and more of a product, the value that we get as we have more units starts to fall for the individual as well. So this one was people are different in where their kind of starting place is. But then all of these people, whether you're the low value customer or the high value customer, also bump into this law that things get, we get kind of tired of things as we go. So a law of diminishing <coughs> marginal benefit, I'm gonna give kind of an abbreviated <coughs> de definition here. So additional unit of units of consumption bring fewer and fewer benefits. And we'll put our example there. The first <coughs> Oreo cookie versus the seventh Oreo. So then the interaction of people trying to make themselves happy. So here we got people trying to maximize happiness, which they get through eating cookies and drinking beer. And here we got businesses trying to maximize, what are they trying to maximize? Profit. profit. So they are trying to maximize profit through the sale of cookies or the sale of beer. The interaction of sellers and buyers gives us ultimately a price that brings us to what we call equilibrium, kind of a happy resting point where buyer's demands are met with seller's supplies. And so at this price of beer, just to make up a number here, let's say it's uh, $24. Apparently my thing's not drawn to scale very good. So at $24, we come to rest. So kind of our key point with the market is the interaction and exchange, exchanges of buyers and sellers will gravitate toward an equilibrium price. 
and quantity. The interaction and exchanges of buyers and sellers will bring us to an equilibrium price and quantity. So equilibrium equilibrium is a situation where there is no tendency for change. situation where there's no tendency for change. <clears throat> so at this price, let's look at what's going on. At this price, the quantity of beer that producers want to supply to the market is this amount. And the quantity that people want to buy, I go over to the demand curve and drop down, is just equal to it. So at this price of 24, we have the wants and desires of two groups meeting each other. At $24, they want to supply, let me make up a number here, of 100 cases. So suppliers put a hundred on the shelves and buyers want to buy a hundred uh, units. So they, the two have kind of figured out a price that's a win-win situation for them both. If price was still at 32, this would not be an equilibrium. If we look at 32, the quantity being supplied is greater than the quantity people want to buy. Prices are too high. And so if the sellers try to get 32, what are they going to end up with? So they price their beer at 32. Why is that not in equilibrium? Because not a lot of people will buy it. Not a lot of people buy it, and they have a bunch of leftover beer. What do companies do when they have leftover beer? Put it on sale to get rid of it, right? So it, it's a signal that they this price was too high and it needs to come down. Well, likewise at five dollars, if they dropped it to five dollars, now everybody wants beer. Even the person who had the alcoholic mom and dad, they're like, geez, that's cheaper than Coca-Cola. Hell yeah, let's get it, let's hit the barley, right? So they're all excited to get some beer because Coca-Cola is running eight dollars and they're like, oh, I'll drink beer. Did you guys know that's part of history? of why, uh, why beer was drank in some cases, that it was just cheaper relative to other things. Uh, and it also was a sterilizer. So going through making the beer process would uh, sterilize the water and you wouldn't get sick as much. So a lot of good things going on here with beer, especially at $5. But the problem is at $5, these guys aren't making any money. And so they only put on the shelves a few beers and there's a whole bunch of people that come to get it, right? So that signals to the business owner, hey, my prices are too low. I need to have my prices go up. And so they raise their prices. And so this kind of goes back and forth through, that's what I wanted to say here, kind of the interaction and exchanges. They might have had a few exchanges here and then they learned, oh, that's too high, that's too low. And then all of a sudden we kind of come to this 24 that seems to make sense for both of them, where the, both of their desires are met. Okay, any questions or comments there? Okay, so let's write that down because this will come back to us. What I just said there will kind of uh, be a part of what we see in the international chapter when we have uh, prices around the world a little different. So I wanted to make sure we spent a little time there. So, um, note. If price is too high, at 
$32, then there is a surplus. The textbook also calls it an excess supply. So surplus or excess supply. There's too much being supplied. There's an excess of supply. If price is at $32, then there is a surplus. And it signals to the business it needs to lower the price. So 32 was not in equilibrium. The two parties aren't happy. Likewise, if price is too low at $5, then there is a shortage or excess demand. shortage or excess demand and it signals the producer to increase price. And so where quantity demand equals quantity supplied, we have our equilibrium price of $24. All right, well, that looks like a good spot to wrap. Wow, right at uh, 